Welcome to the Cybersecurity Simplified Podcast, where we take the mystery out of today's top security threats and solutions. The rules of B2B marketing have changed. Traditional plays won't cut it anymore. From AI content overload to dark social, five major disruptors are shaking up the game. Callie Henderson, Chief Content Officer at Buzz Theory, breaks down the new playing field and how cybersecurity partners can bring their A game. Tune in for winning strategies that will keep you ahead of the competition. Hey, everyone. So glad to be here. I'm your host, Susanna Song, Chief Marketing Officer at Highwire Networks. And so great to have my friend and mentor, Callie Henderson. So great to have you on the pod. Oh, thanks for inviting me. I'm super excited to finally be on this Cybersecurity Simplified. So thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. There's no one better to bring on when it comes to cybersecurity marketing because we are in such a noisy space. I mean, I feel like there are new SaaS companies and service-based companies that are popping up. And it's like, as marketers, how do we differentiate ourselves? So I'm curious, you know, we, we teased it already, but there are five Ds that are disrupting B2B marketing. And really, it covers, in general, all B2B marketing. But when we focus on cybersecurity, it's definitely um, something that you're seeing. Yeah, for sure. So there's a, I mean, it's a crazy time. Everything in marketing is changing right now, which um, makes it very challenging for any companies in the tech space, but particularly for people selling cybersecurity, which isn't exactly the the easiest thing to market, right? So you yeah. have different constraints on what you need to be talking about, you know, pushing a few fear buttons, but it's really a preventative protective thing that you're trying to sell. So, you know, you have to, you have a another bar that you have to mm-hmm. jump as a cybersecurity marketer. Yeah, absolutely. So what what is the first D, Callie? Yeah. So the first D is actually displacement of search. So traditional search. So we're talking about like Google or Bing type of search. And really um, what that means is that Gen AI, which we've been talking about probably a lot, (laughs) um, is now going to be displacing that. So if you think about it um, in your own searching, you probably have noticed that at the top, there is um, sort of a generated answer to whatever mm-hmm. you asked, right? right? And usually it will have sourcing in it. Plus, there are not only Google, but there's Plexity and Anthropic and several others that are out there that are providing alternatives, Gen AI search. Mm-hmm. So now, you have to be dealing with that. So it isn't the same as it was in the traditional environment. And we'll talk a little bit about um, how you end up dealing with that change in a minute. So, Yeah, so when you say Gen I is replacing the traditional search, are you saying like decision makers who are out there shopping, uh, they won't necessarily come and type out, you know, a particular product or service or no, they, they, have a they will they will but they'll either even if they go to google now mm-hmm. they'll get an answer that looks like a chat gpt answer and yeah. they'll just figure it out from there and a lot of times the companies that are mentioned in those answers the sources that are mentioned in those answers actually get clicked on right because mm-hmm. you don't have to go down below and see <laughs> the search results, right? Or right. if you go to some place like Perplexity for your answers, which a lot of people are doing, they don't even have a traditional search at all. So they're just going there. What is this? Is my question? What is the answer? So, um, so that's a big deal because a lot mm-hmm. of companies rely on traditional search to get their answers and to find vendors. Yeah. And so that's something new that we have to deal with. And it's only going to get better. I mean, bigger, I guess, the share of it. Um, Gartner is saying something like um, 50% of traffic on traditional search will go away, literally disappear by 2028. All right. So 
So hang tight, because uh, I'm hoping Callie has some solutions here after we, we, we address all five, because I'm curious. I have questions about that. Number two, death of third party cookies. Yeah, so I would say the death of third party cookies actually is greatly exaggerated. And for those of you that follow this, know that um, Google has been saying for the last um, four years that they're going to deprecate cookies mm-hmm. and get rid of them. Well, um, just recently they went back on that. So that's not going to happen. However, we are still dealing with an environment where data privacy is an important concern to people, which is the whole reason why cookies were going away. Apple already had decided to do that a couple of years ago. So when you're on uh, Apple products, you have to opt in for cookies, right? So so now you're going to have to be focusing a lot more on first-party data, which is data that you generate yourself instead of third-party data. Now, Mm -hmm. you know, we're all excited that we got a reprieve from Google. And so some of the things that we've been doing will continue. But um, this back and forth that they've been doing, it's sort of like it's been dying and then they resuscitated. It's been Mm -hmm. dying. (laughs) So keep bringing it back. (laughs) Yeah, the writing's on the wall that it'll probably at some point might disappear. And we just need to be prepared for that. So so we're a little fortunate that we have a reprieve, reprieve here. But it's still something that we need to be thinking about is how do we develop our first party data? Mm -hmm. So I think the third one's interesting because I, it's a big frustration for me uh, when, (laughs) when you want to be creative and original and there's just way too much content out there and it's not original. (laughs) So what's the third D? (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So we're calling it deluge of AI generated content. And the reason that we're calling it that is because, you know, it, if you've ever used any of the um, the generative AI engines like ChatGPT, you just sure. ask it something and it just <laughs> it creates a bunch of stuff, and it's Crazy. very tempting yeah. to just put it on your website, right? You know, and create a bunch of content. Since particularly since you know a lot of us are really busy as marketers and we <laughs> don't have a ton of time, and it just seems like a great shortcut. Well, um, it's. It's not for many reasons, but one of the one of them is that Google penalizes you for that. So that's your your big um, reason for not wanting it immediately is that you're looking at oh. forty to forty five percent of content is being penalized, you know, and websites are being shut down for it. It's really not worth you know, it. No, it's not worth it, especially Mm -hmm. if you're relying on Google to get a lot of your leads. However, there is a more longer term problem with AI content in that um, it becomes super generic and you're not distinguishing yourself from anyone else. Plus, it's not really authoritative. It doesn't show your (laughs) expertise. It doesn't, a lot of the things that you need to be doing as a company to differentiate yourself, how can you know, how can you differentiate if your content's the same as the next person because you both got it from yeah, I, I did an AI see, engine. I did see a LinkedIn post where uh, there was one comment like, oh, this is great AI-generated content. <laughs> like, people could could see it. Like, they as soon as they read it, they're like, this looks like AI, or this reads like AI. So I thought that was interesting. I've seen it a couple of times where people are like, this doesn't seem like original. Like I've definitely read this before. So I, I, yeah, I found that. Yeah, so, and, and, and that's a, a huge risk, especially if you're putting yourself out there as an expert in an area, you know, yeah. to p- put generic content on doesn't really, doesn't really serve you very well. You're not showing your expertise. And um, one of the things that uh, my partner likes to say a lot is like, Hey, you know, especially if it's an area where um, you're an expert and you can tell right away that it's generic, that it's just basics, it's superficial. Well, you know, if you read something in another um, industry, you think it sounds amazing. Well, it's shallow and it doesn't really actually provide the information you think it's providing. So, um, you know, and then there are there are tales tells (laughs) tells <laughs> that AI has with um, certain words it use. I know I have friends in marketing. They're like, if I see the word delve again, no one uses that <laughs> word. It's a, you know, 
also um, another one that AI likes to use, robust. It likes to use robust. So yeah, you know, I mean, there's just some things that you can mm-hmm. see that it does. <laughs> I don't, but, you, you know, I generated content, but I actually do like both of those words. I know, expert. right? And so, but I, I'm just saying that, you know, people general. find stuff, but, you know, experts in, in some of these areas um, clearly are going to be able to easily see through it. So you mm-hmm. really have to figure out ways to, you know, make it, we'll talk about this a little yeah. bit, <laughs> how to rise above the fray, basically. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, the fourth one, I'm curious what dark social, what that entails and what, what oh, you're trying to right. convey there. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of it sounds all sinister, doesn't uh-huh. it? But um, <laughs> actually, basically what it is, is there are um, a bunch of decision makers in particular who find out about new products, new things on uh-huh. social And they are never going to click on it. They're never going to comment. They're not going to do it because they don't want to be put into your funnels. So Mm. it's this this idea of a funnel fatigue. They don't want to be targeted. They don't want to be. So what they do instead is they say, oh, I heard about this. And they either tell somebody who's in their procurement team or whoever handles that area or they go themselves in to your website, right? So then yes. when you look at Google Analytics, it looks like they just went, you know, Straight. it's organic traffic. Yeah. Well, it's not. So how do you attribute it to where they actually yeah. saw it? Okay, so so then you're looking at um, not really understanding who's who you're appealing to, you're not actually tracking that information. So dark just means you can't see it. That's all that means. So you can't really see where they come from. But um, it also leads into another issue, which is actually the number five point, which is disjointed pipelines. And what that has to do with is the reason that you experience funnel fatigue a lot of times is because you're mismatching your intention signals. So you might have somebody who's really ready to talk to you and you put them in a nurture track for mm-hmm. education. And they're like, okay, I I just want to, I need to see the demo. I'm ready to talk to you. I don't mm-hmm. care about, you know, being in a nurture track. I don't want to do that. Yes. And so people... It gets confusing. The other thing is that sales and marketing are coordinating. That also causes uh-huh. problems. So this disjointed pipeline problem, um, you know, really causes issues with moving people actually to the next stage of the buying process, uh-huh. and it turns people off. So it's something that we have to be watching for. Yeah, I want to. I want to delve deeper than that. <laughs> okay. In a minute. <laughs> Um, so let's, let's start, actually, let's just start right there. We'll work our way backwards. Um, so strategies for, for cybersecurity businesses and partners who should use what, what, what strategies they should use to combat these five D's. Um, right. I mean, so, yeah, so there, there are quite a few things that, um, that they can do. And some of them will sound like, um, you know, things they might have heard about before, but they're more and more important now. So things that they need to be doing in a, you know, just to be cute, they need to bring their A game and you'll find out because all of these answers to the five D's are five A's, right? So <laughs> anyway, you are a true marketer, bring... Callie. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it can't help, can't help it. So yeah, um, but it's easier to remember things mm-hmm. when they're, they're grouped. Marketing secret for you. Um, so what they need to be thinking about is actually focusing on building their audience, right? So being able to attract people that see them as experts, which okay. is the second p- piece, building authority. So once you become more authoritative, 
you one get more traffic from Google if it's on your website, but it also shows your expertise. So you're doing both things. Mm -hmm. The other thing is is you need to be authentic, which is real and having real data, not generic AI content, right? You do yeah. sit, you need to show that you're a real human person, right? that you're actually an expert that can help them, that you're not just a, a room full of computers, right? That's why I, that's so, why I love case studies, because <laughs> you, you're using a real life experience of, of something th that your customers Perfect. went through, right? And you can say, hey, like, you have, it has to be original. How are you going to replicate that from from generative AI? Like, yeah. it's always something that you and your customers went through that you can write about. and. Um, I, that's why I love case studies and success stories. Yes. And so social proof is in, is a very, very, very important part of um, being authentic, right? Mm -hmm. Is having, you know, your customers vouch for you, having yeah. those stories, having those that real world experience, all of that is going to help you. Um, the other one is atomization. And, and really what that means is instead of just creating one piece of content, spin it out into other places. And I know everyone's going to be like, duh, you're supposed to do that. <laughs> yeah, you are, but no one does this. So it's like if you actually create a process for making this happen, it will um, actually help you. So now I'm going to tell you that one of the best use cases for AI is atomization. Yeah. So you're taking original content and letting AI help you to chunk that up into great social posts, into uh, blogs, into um, email campaigns, into okay. you know other ways that you can get it. Sometimes AI is terrific at editing video for you, for example, So, which is another way to atomize content. So, you know, you can still use some of these tools <laughs> and, you know, leverage some of the things that are coming out to benefit you while actually getting your message out. The last one, um, number five, is alignment, which we had talked about a little bit um, earlier, is you know avoiding putting people into a funnel situation at the wrong stage. So you want the right message to the right person at the right time, right? And so it's easy to say, but it's harder to do. But we need to be focusing on creating that alignment and understanding the buyer intent signal and where they are and giving them the information that they need at the time they need it. So somebody wants to buy from you, you schedule the call or you schedule the demo. You know, if somebody is just looking loo, maybe they need to be in that nurture track to educate them. Hey, by the way, we're doing this or we would like yeah. to invite you to the webinar or whatever. Um, so those things need to still happen. You also really need to, and I, I'm stressing this for the marketers, is you need to be really aligning with your sales teams. So if you aren't, I mean, that's your whole reason for existence. And I know that it's going to make some marketers feel a little defensive because they, they sometimes feel like it's a combative relationship, but your whole reason for being is to support the sales team. And so your measures and everything that you're doing yep. should be aligned and the same. So, and if you can show them that, then they won't be combative. They will actually partner with you mm -hmm. and work with you and appreciate the efforts that you're bringing to the table. So. Yeah, I 100% agree on the alignment. You've got to be two peas in a pod working together on the same strategy. And we all have the same end goal. It's not for marketing to outshine sales, sales to outshine marketing and prove them wrong. It's for that same goal. Um, and that's to right. grow your business and grow revenue for the company. Perfect, exactly. But, and you know, and I know it sounds super simplistic, but that's exactly it. <laughs> you guys yeah. are, if it's not driving revenue, then you guys are misaligned on what your goals are. I do want to revisit dark social because I do that. I, I am that person who's scrolling <laughs> and I'm not clicking because I know better. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't cheat emails, yeah. enter my inbox or a direct message because I clicked. Um, sometimes people just want to be in control and when, when the time is right, 
to then contact the vendor or or the right. sales team. You know, and and that's why you need to be aware that this is happening and yes. that it's significant numbers. Um, actually, I might I might have numbers in here about what it was, how many it was, but um, it's significant numbers of people. Let me see if I can see it. Uh, estimates are oh really high, eighty four to ninety five percent of decision makers don't interact with content. So, you know, they are mm. trying to shield themselves from being the funnels. So if your funnels yes. were a little bit better, perhaps, but you know, they're already scarred. So what they're, they're, they're just not trackable in the mm -hmm. same ways that we're used to doing. So you need to be aware that those people are out there and continue to provide the information that they need and in ways that they can get it when they need it and when mm -hmm. they want it. So that's yeah. really the key. And so um, just understanding mm -hmm. that so many of the decision makers are outside your, what you can see, mm -hmm. you have to continue to create all of these things, building your audience, building your authority, your authenticity, being everywhere with your content. <laughs> yeah, regardless Bullying. of clicks, right? I think there are a lot of people, uh, me included, whether it's on social media or, you know, just tracking, you know, tracking um, metrics on, on our website. Sometimes you get a little discouraged when you're not seeing as much engagement, right? Or, or click your click-through rate isn't as high on social media, but it, 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 I think it's just a reminder too that, Brand awareness is so important, and branding, just being memorable as, the, like, like you said, the authority <laughs> that you are the expert in that field is really critical. Right. So, brand actually matters, right? Brand matters maybe more than ever right now, and so I know a lot of people dismiss that. You know that it's something more the foo foo side of marketing, but um, if you look at the biggest companies in our in tech or even in the world, mm -hmm. their brands are very well known, and they spent they spend a ton of money, and they continue to spend a ton of money just on branding. And branding isn't just their logo; branding is all of their you know their voice, their tone, their style, their their mission. It's their value system it's everything about them and they spend a lot of money on that and your brand what you stand for is more important now than maybe it ever has been i mean it's and so it sort of feels a little bit like we're going back to the beginning of marketing and the way we used to market before digital a little bit right where only we do have the advantage of all the digital tools and the digital avenues, but some of the basics of branding and building audiences and authority and all of that are very important right now, more important than ever. So, yeah. you know, maybe we should talk a little bit about, you know, why this matters for cybersecurity partners. Yeah. And so, your audience. <laughs> no, and then that's... Uh, I'm glad you brought it up because I mean, how many times do I get partners coming to to me and to my my team asking, you know, how how do I get in front of these end, end customer uh, prospects? So, so I think that one thing that they've got that they need to flaunt more is that they are experts in the cybersecurity area, mm -hmm. right? So they need to establish that at every turn but every opportunity that they have and by do the way they do that is by getting in front of people either on their own website but usually i advocate outside so speaking at events you know doing press releases doing by bylined articles doing things like you you know talking to people like you used to be reporters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things that Highwear does a lot is mm -hmm. they're on the evening news. Yeah. Right? Because they are the expert in like the crowd stray, you know, outage that just happened. I think yeah. that you guys were on TV for that. 
taking yep. advantage of those opportunities and saying, hey, I'm dealing with this with my customer. I'm an expert in this. I would, you know, I can speak to this topic if you want to know about it. You know, putting out blogs, regular content, regular posts, regular PR, regular speaking, volunteering to be on committees. I mean, CompTIA is a great one. Um, you know, they have a huge cybersecurity uh, effort that's industry wide, and they bring people in. And they're always looking for experts that want to be part of that. And once you start getting elevated in that community, then you can leverage that for some other opportunities, speaking mm -hmm. in your local area, being the source for your local paper. Yeah. Being at, you know, and, and you start to become well known. And, you know, then people start to seek you out as being the expert in your, in your space. Yeah. And, you know, and I will speak uh, as a former journalist, we're always looking for credible sources, right? And I and I think for a lot of business owners and the cybersecurity uh, practitioners who say, oh, you know, the media already has, they already have enough experts. No, that the truth is we're always looking to grow our database of experts and to get fresh fresh blood in essentially who have, who have different ideas, newer ideas, a different perspective. No, and especially in your in your local area, you know, like if some of you out there are smaller MSPs that have a, a region that you're serving, you know, that's especially true. Go to the business journal and just look mm -hmm. like, hey, you know, I'm I'm your local expert on some of these issues. I can give yeah. you some real color about what happened to the people in your community when this outage happened or mm -hmm. this attack happened or what can they do? Some real tips to, you know, to help them move forward. And journalists, you know, they're busy, but they're, you know, if you have a relevant and timely thing to say, they're more likely to listen to you. And, you know, and being local, mm -hmm. they'll be like, oh, I've got a local expert. I don't have to go to somebody in a big city, Yeah, you know, 2,000 miles away. Yeah. And so. at, le at least like I, I would say if they don't use you now, they they'll come to you when when they're in a bind or when there's there's a breaking news of, of some sort of breach. Uh, they'll come. They'll find you. But they first need to know you're out there. So make that connection. Um, Callie, you're we're, we're running out of time. Your final. Comment or final advice to. B2B marketers, and particularly those of us who are in the cybersecurity space? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, you know, right now, cybersecurity is really important to everybody. And so, you know, we have that advantage that people are interested. What they're, what they're really struggling, though, with is who should they align with in order to secure their environment? So, your opportunity really is to be that con consultative expert because that's what you are as an MSP. You understand the space, you're providing a service, you're able to deliver to them a solution to this problem that is not just a box or a firewall. It's a much more comprehensive end-to-end -end solution and perspective that you're offering them. So I think that you need to lean into that yeah. and, you know, focus on elevating your expertise as much as possible and um, doing that and leveraging the tools, the marketing tools and marketing things like PR and media and, and AI to an extent, like I mm -hmm. said, for atomization. Yeah. And, um, you know, making sure that people know that you know what you're talking about and that you can help them. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Your services <laughs> are not just in a black box. They are a lot more robust. And I just had to put that word in there for, for the very end. Uh, corny. I, I, I'm very corny. Okay. Well, thank you so much uh, to my friend and guest, Callie Henderson. And of course, thank you to our listeners for joining us. If you have feedback, about today's podcast or you have questions for Callie, you want to uh, get to know what she does, um, you want to maybe have her elaborate a little bit more on, on how she helps 
uh, marketing teams and marketers in the cybersecurity space and really across B2B. Um, we will have her information on our landing page and in the comment section below. So thanks again. Uh, and be sure to join us for our next episode. We'll keep this going um, in a couple of weeks. So until next time, I'm Susanna Song, and this is Cybersecurity Simplified. From all of us here at Overwatch by Highwire Networks, thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, rate the episodes you enjoyed, share, and leave us a comment. We'll catch you next time on the Cybersecurity Simplified podcast. Remember, the more you know about cybersecurity, the safer you'll be. To learn more, visit us at highwirenetworks.com slash podcast.